good morning or whatever time of day that uh, you come across this. I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did a video called uh, This Week in the MCU, where I was just kind of collating some assorted thoughts, uh, basically the about the finale of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier series on Disney+, Plus, and also um, the Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings trailer. So uh, I'm going to do something similar today. I don't really have an episode to review, but I do have uh, another trailer to analyze, and I do have uh, a news story I wanted to discuss uh, that I had been attempting to discuss on Facebook and was meeting with eh, less than receptive audience. I'm not sure if the audience here will be more receptive, but at least I can try to explain myself, uh, you know, beyond the confines of a, a Facebook comment or whatever. Um, so anyway, what I'm going to do today is uh, I don't usually do these. Uh, well, I don't know if I ever do these uh, trailer reaction videos, movie reaction videos, and a lot of them look really silly. Um, and, and I've talked about this before. And I know it comes off as kind of elitist, and I don't mean it to. I really don't. It's just uh, I've spent my life a long time uh, passionately uh, delving into uh, mediums, media, comic books, and uh, films, long-form storytelling, sequential storytelling. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the discourse surrounding this stuff uh, on social media is it's kind of starting to hit an all-time low. Um, and a lot of it is, to me, it's the same problem that there exists in journalism in general. I mean, the journalism about this kind of stuff is really a, a, just a... a just a glaring example, but in general, you know, journalism standards have, have plummeted again to an all-time low. Uh, they're basically stenographers or what the government uh, or corporations want them to uh, tell us to think. Um, with the comics, movies, news, pop culture world, uh, with all the fan bro sites, you know, all the way dating back to like Ain't It Cool News and comic book resources and, you know, and then all the ones we have today like Screen Ran and Bleeding Cool and um, The Beat and, uh, you know, I'm not saying lumping these all the same caliber of quality, but I do see even the venerated ones uh, all the way down to the, the, the one guy on YouTube with a basic setup like me. And I'm not talking about myself, not, not to like brag or anything, but uh, I see the quality, I see the reactions of, there's a sameness to them. And I may have covered some of this in my, um, what does a comic book creator really do uh, video. Um, it's frustrating because what happens is people throw things out as facts that aren't facts. Uh, and they don't want to learn anything beyond the facts because of their confirmation bias, which, you know, I guess all of us have about certain things to a certain extent. I try to avoid it. I'm getting, you know, I've really evolved in that area, but, you know, I'm not perfect in that area. Um, case in point, uh, trailer for the Eternals or Eternals uh, from MCU, uh, I think supposedly coming out maybe September of this year. Now, now see, I was talking about facts and truth. If I don't know for sure the answer to something, I'm just going to say I'm not sure. Um, I'm not going to blatantly lie to you uh, or just follow a rumor mill. Um, so that's why I'd like to feel like my channel is different. You know, maybe I'm a lone voice in the wilderness, but I love this kind of material. I love this kind of art. And I feel it is it is being done a disservice by the vast majority of cyber coverage of it uh, over the last couple of years, especially. Um, I 
feel like most videos now are a guy or guys. I call them fan bros. They're almost always, almost invariably, you know, uh, middle class white guys. Um, you know, and they have a lot more equipment to work with than I do. Uh, and, you know, they're a bit younger than me. And that's all well and good. But I mean, occasionally you'll see a black guy and a woman. Uh, but, you know, they're either inveterate, these people are either inveterate hipsters, uh, which I have kind of disdain for, because they're going to know it all. Hipsters used to hate comic book culture and, and, even to an extent, uh, thumb their nose at cinema. They generally were into, you know, fashion and uh, music. Um, though, though movies to an extent, but comic books, no. That's a very recent development in America, anyway. Um, but anyway, the, the fan bros are basically guys who, they circulate all these wild, unsubstantiated speculations uh, and they miss context, key context of what their speculation is founded on. It's, it's just, it's fanfic. It's like, this is what I want to see happen. Wouldn't this be neat? It's like, but that's, that's not news, you know, and that's not illumination. That's not insight. Uh, that's not sharing informed opinions or having a dialogue. It's not even having a good monologue. It's just uh, yammering the same way they yammer on, on, Facebook, the same way they used to yammer on the uh, alt news group boards, uh, you know, back in the 90s. So uh, a lot of it is what some people have dubbed, and I avoid this word unless I absolutely can't, and I, in this case, I guess I can't, but it is like toxic fandom, and, you know, uh, it gives us all a bad name who are fans of these kind of works. So I'd like to approach things a little bit differently with both these items I want to cover today. Um, Eternals trailer, I watched the trailer twice. Uh, once just watched it and, and had a first impression or what they call now a hot take. Wasn't going to put that in a video though. Uh, then later I watched it a second time and analyzed it a bit more. Um, tried to take it in more. And, and then I watched a kind of one of those blow by blow, frame by frame kind of uh, Easter egg, uh, you know, what does it all mean kind of things, uh, kind of videos. And, you know, I commented on this in my last, this week in the MCU video that the one I watched for Shang-Chi, um, I was about to say Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu, Shang-Chi and Legend of the Ten Rings, that guy's video, uh, it, it really helped me because uh, I, I was I went back and I did uh, I did it myself after he showed me, you know, uh, pointed me in the right directions. He did a lot of frame by frames, and his stuff was very based on facts and strong possibilities, and based on like this happened in the comic books. Like this is what the Mandarin did here. So I wonder if this correlates to what we're seeing here. Is this an adaptation that they're kind of reconfiguring? Same with Fu Manchu because, again, some of these guys don't even get it, get this yet. But uh, the Tony Leung character, Wen Wu, uh, in Shang-Chi is an amalgamate of the Mandarin, the longtime Iron Man foe, with Fu Manchu, Sax Romer's classic character who Marvel no longer has the rights to use and who was the biological father of Shang-Chi in his original series. So, um, you know, I saw a grounding in this guy's video, like he knew what to talk about, he knew what information to give you and to make you more intrigued. And a lot of these videos, their, their point of view is, I guess, is how good of a movie is this gonna be, i.e. how great of a, MCU roller coaster ride is this going to be, and how does it tie into all the other ones and the next few movies coming out? And what if this storyline I liked that came out like two years ago, uh, you know, was that was cool, is going to be adapted? And it's like, I don't 
see things remotely like that. I know you guys have probably figured that from me. I'm not a current Marvel Comics fan co uh, collector at all. I didn't dislike Marvel Comics. I, I appreciate and enjoy Marvel uh, Studios. But I grew up with Marvel Comics and I was an avid collector for many years, uh, longer than quite a lot of the fan bros have been walking this planet. And, you know, I'm not bragging. I mean, I'm I'm old, you know, it's not it's not a badge of honor. But but I have accrued a certain amount of I don't want to say wisdom, but a certain amount of just fucking knowledge and context for that knowledge. So with the Eternals, we're talking about a series created in the late 1970s uh, during Jack Kirby's uh, final uh, stint at Marvel Comics. Um, he had left uh, in 1970 under not the best terms and was given a kind of an unprecedented contract and freedom with DC and he created the fourth world uh, which in you know fan bro circles is what they point to as yeah what Kirby do after he broke up with Lee I mean fourth world didn't set the world on fire it's like Lee didn't do anything really after that and Kirby Fourth World is, you know, extremely influential in DC mythology. And if you recall, uh, Dark Seed and, and uh, Dark Side and Steppenwolf were the much touted villains of the Zack Snyder's Justice League. So I would say in the mother boxes, I would say Kirby's DC stuff has found its way to the top of pop culture, just like his Marvel stuff. So, you know, these are just Lee Partisans. I call them Lee Partisans, and I don't I don't pay attention to what they say, really, except just to roll my eyes. Uh, there's no Stan Lee in this, in this scenario. It's all Jack Kirby. When he came back to Marvel, he was writing, ran directing. Now, writing, uh, illustrating, penciling, and um, editing his own book under the auspices of the editor-in-chief, who I believe at that time... I'm not sure who it was when he first came back. It could have been Marv Wolfman, but I know Archie Goodwin was one, and then Jim Shooter, and, and well, you know, Jim Shooter ran every one of talent off, but, you know. Um, the Eternals was a fun series. It, it, hit, it came out, uh, I don't want to say I was the right age. Maybe I was. I was pretty damn young, and uh, me and my friend Thomas Davis, we were avid Eternals fans, and we wanted the Eternals to be in the Marvel Universe, and we're excited when Icarus, the main Eternal character, battled this Hulk, which turned out to be a, a cosmic irradiated robot version, but still the Hulk, and they mentioned, you know, a S.H.I.E.L.D. and an issue, and the Inhumans in passing, and it's obvious that it took place in the Marvel Universe, but it wasn't so anal and, and, and strictured as... Roy Thomas kind of made a sound when he brought them full on into the Marvel Universe later in Thor. It was really just, again, the sign of an auteur, Jack Kirby. I mean, he created S.H.I.E.L.D., Hulk, the Inhumans, and Eternals. He, he can have them meeting or, or crossing paths any fucking way he wants to. It's it's not, it transcends the, the anal retentive Marvel Universe, which I certainly have a fondness for in many ways. Don't get me wrong. I used to be you know, really that, um, anal about continuity. I'm certainly anal about continuity in my own story, Flickr Street, but it's just me. So, you know, it's a little different than the uh, writing by committee uh, corporate model. Um, so Kirby, if Kirby wanted to throw the Hulk in there, he could throw the fucking Hulk in there. If he wanted him to be a robot, he could be a robot. Uh, if he wants to see some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents come across the Celestial... Why not? It, it was his playground. It was his universe. It didn't belong solely to Stan Lee. It, it, on a corporate level, it did belong solely to Marvel. But uh, the Kirby lawsuit uh, against Marvel and against Stan Lee in recent years did change the credits uh, and financial recompense, I believe, for, for Kirby's heirs a good bit. So I am expecting... Uh, the Eternals to say created by Jack Kirby. Just created by Jack Kirby. The first Marvel, such Marvel credit. I'm kind of wary. Maybe I don't need to be, but I'm kind of afraid they're not going to say that. They're not going to mention that. Um, 
because the fans don't really fans like me do, but the, the fan bros don't expect more. You know, they don't they don't give a damn about Jack Kirby. He just got oh, oh he incidentally uh, created him. Anyway, let's talk about how cool they are and groovy in this movie, and let's talk about Neil Gaiman's brilliant run on the Eternals because Neil Gaiman is the greatest writer ever. And this is this is the kind of stuff I got out of some of the videos I watched last night. Uh, there seems to be a, a growing consensus that based on the flimsy evidence in the trailer that uh, Neil Gaiman and John Romita Jr.'s brief tenure on the Eternals in the 2000s is the template for this series. And that, of course, excited these people no end. I thought they were going to orgasm on camera. I'm not a big Neil Gaiman fan. Uh, I dislike a lot of his writing. I enjoy some of his writing. I respect him. He's a pretty nice guy. I've met him a couple of times. Uh, I hated his Eternal series. Everything about it I hated. I thought it was completely off the mark. And John Romita Jr., you know, I used to be a fan of his work to an extent on Daredevil and Spider-Man when he started getting, you know, more of his signature style. But by the time he got to Eternals, I, I think his work has played out. Uh, he could stand to really look at some photo references. <laughs> He's, his cartooning is, is kind of weak. I mean, I liked his work on The Incredible Hulk briefly with Bruce Jones, too. It was idiosyncratic, and he usually excelled with a good inker like Klaus Janssen. But um or uh well much earlier in his career damn green but um i don't care for john Romita jr's art anymore and, and the the work he's doing for dc i think is really ugly particularly um so he did not capture i, I to a lot of people he did capture the grandeur of the kirby art from the original eternals to me hell no and I don't know why Gaiman and his work for Marvel settled for substandard artists instead of the glorious kind of artists and idiosyncratic artists he sought out on Sandman. Uh, the Kubert brothers for his uh, 1602 were just, you know, they're perfunctory storytellers. You know, they don't really distract from the story, but they don't really add to it either. Um, they're not like their father. Um, and John Romita Jr. is also just such an artist, a workmanlike artist. Um, he did not capture Kirby's, uh, uh, that vibe, uh, that look. Um, and he redesigned unnecessarily some of the characters. Uh, and then, of course, there was the editorial mandate, which wasn't Neil Gaiman's fault, to tie it in closely with the Civil War series going on at the time, which was just trash. Love the movie, uh, but, you know, I'm not a Mark Millar fan either. I liked a little bit of his stuff, but uh, Kick-Ass is okay. But, again, I think he in, embodies some of the crassness of the modern wave of uh, mainstream comic book writers. Um, so, I yeah, I thought Eternals was really just something that should best be forgotten, but because of Gaiman and Ramita's popularity... It's assumed legendary status, it seems like, more so than the original series. Uh, so I guess it introduced a new generation to the Eternals, but it's kind of like when somebody says, sees a Quentin Tarantino movie and says, uh, you know, a film cineast will be like, cineast will be like, well, yeah, he ripped off this, 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 this better movie. Uh, and then the Quentin Tarantino apologist will say, yeah, but these people would have never heard of any of these old movies. And because of Tarantino, he single-handedly is getting all these people to go back and, and watch these old works. And I'll be honest, I've met very few people like that who start with Tarantino, a, a voice a voice of their generation, uh, part of their zeitgeist, and have gone backward and become like deep aficionados uh, of his influences um, to the point where maybe they – transcend Tarantino and see his flaws and see, well, you know, there was better stuff out there that Tarantino just kind of synthesized and repackaged and commodified for another generation. Um, so same with this, you know, uh, a lot of people may have loved the game in Ramita Eternals. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it inspired many people to go back and buy those Kirby comic books. Anyway, I've got all of them, and, and I know the mythos from that, and also from 
their next wave of stories, which were in Mighty Thor, uh, a, a over two year run by Roy Thomas. And um, then there was a mini series by Peter B. Gillis, which was pretty well done. Uh, our OK art by Sal Bashima. Uh, unfortunately, Gillis had to leave or something. Uh, there, there's landscaping out here, it sounds like, sorry. And um, Walt Simonson took over the writing and it really, you know, it wasn't up to his Thor standards, not, not at all. Uh, even though with the obvious tie-ins with Thor there. Beyond those three arcs, I, I haven't kept up with all the many, many, many series except for the game in Romita one I did read. So, I guess I'm trying to provide you a little context. So let's just go through the trailer. And I'm literally, it's a short, it's two minute teaser trailer. I'm literally going to watch it with you. I'm trying to have it too loud here to, you know, knock off my microphone problem. Uh, so it begins with the sweeping vista. They're going out, you know, across the water. Uh, this song by Skeeter Davis, End of the World, I think. I'm not familiar with it. It sounds pretty good. And it's showing these primitive tribes people, and uh, they see a, a floating, it's not like a monolith, like in 2001 A Space Odyssey, which of course Jack Kirby adapted for Marvel Comics. Maybe it's a takeoff on that. It's not a vertical monolith. It's like a horizontal monolith with some like symbols along the sides. It doesn't look like a celestial ship, but then you realize it's an eternal ship. So that scene itself, I don't specifically remember in any of the comic books. They've kind of crunched these things kind of together. We may not even see the Celestials. Um, it's hard to say. But uh, piloting or whatever the ship is, the characters, Cersei and Icarus. Okay, so his character's name is not Icarus, it's Icarus. Now, when I was a kid, I pronounced it Icarus because it had a K and because that's just how I thought it was pronounced. Then in school, I heard about the legend of Icarus, I-C-A-R-U-S. But it's, you know, all of Kirby, not all, but many of Kirby's names were riffs on mythological names because he was saying the Eternals were the basis for those mythological figures, Zoras equals Zeus, Athena equals Athena, Makari equals Mercury, Circe equals Circe, different spelling, and Icarus, Icarus. Now, the thing is, you know, in the first couple of issues, Icarus is uh, disguising as this human guide to an archaeologist who's, you know, digging up the ancient astronaut artifacts. This was the period when that was a, a, a cultural thing, you know, a, a paranormal uh, fascination for people. It was the 1970s, man. My, my dad had the Eric Von Daniken books and Charles Ford, and he had all of the kind of uh, ancient astronauts, the Ezekiel saw the wheel, all of the stuff. So I credit him for getting me deeply into that and interested. And that and, uh, was Kirby, as Kirby was influenced a lot by pop culture, by books and movies like Planet of the Apes for Commandy. Uh, he, he, he was always right on top of the Zeke guys, man. He was always, uh, right with it, uh, or immediately reacting to it or ahead of its curve because he was a genius. So, uh, but yeah, so this, uh, character human that Icarus, uh, pretends to be is named Ike Harris, I-K-E, second word, Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, first and last name. So, yeah, Icarus is his name. That's, that's really what most fans have always called him. Calling him Icarus is just, it, you know what I mean? It, it's like they're, they're undoing Kirby's riff. I mean, they might as well have just called Cersei something different, but I don't know. So anyway, they're aboard the ship, Cersei, and I'm going to call him Icarus for now to, until the fan bros beat my face in. And uh, they're kind of looking out on helping these primitive people, uh, empowering them in some way or another, uh, I assume, you know, guiding them, which that's what the whole premise of Eternals was, is that the Celestials came and 
perform some biological experiments on man's ancestors, you know, kind of the missing link between ape and man, and ended up genetically evolving uh, one strain into the godlike Eternals and um, devolving another strain into the kind of monstrous deviants. I'll go ahead and say this, there are no deviants in this trailer. Now, I mean, I'm not talking about the actor's sexual proclivities. There may be a few, but the deviants that Jack Kirby created them, uh, that Jack Kirby created, there aren't any any indications of them in this trailer uh, or mentioned, nor of the Celestials. So I guess they're keeping all that under wraps. They're kind of wanting you to focus on the Eternals, and the takeaway I have is that the Eternals directed mankind's evolution. Now, there is truth to that in the comics that the Eternals did kind of do that on behalf of the Celestials, and there was a particular Eternal, Ajax, who uh, his costume was kind of like a cross between a Kirby 60s uh, uh, Asgardian kind of costume with a superhero mask and kind of an Aztec Toltec helmet. And he, he lived in the Andes and he anticipated the, a prophecy there that the Celestial, uh, I believe it was the fourth host, uh, but it could have been the third. They say three hosts. Well, actually, they don't say in the video, but one of these uh, reaction videos said there were three hosts. And the guy went on to make some other, anyway. Uh, um, we'll just say third host for the sake of it. So Ajax was preparing for the, the coming of the third host, uh, with Arishim being the, the head celestial. And they were going to set themselves up in the Andes, kind of unmoving, un, unspeaking, unblinking. What, well, they don't blink, they have giant helmets. Uh, these thousand feet tall beings and pass judgment, yay or nay on mankind as they had once before. They had ju passed judgment against mankind once in the past and just caused the great cataclysm which destroyed Lemuria and Atlantis and Marvel later wove that into their own you know, burgeoning mythology uh, for those places a lot of which was based on um Robert E. Howard and Lynn Carter and story writers like that during the barbarian craze of the 70s. Marvel did a good job for a while, especially with Mark Gruenwald working on it and reconciling all these sources into a really epic, sweeping kind of epic uh, narrative. So the Eternals fit pretty good into the Marvel Universe once Roy Thomas kind of explained why there's Olympia and Olympus and Zoras and Zeus and et cetera, et cetera. So this trailer, so then we move, uh, they're talking, uh, first thing I noticed, Cersei is, is an, it looks to be an Asian actress, she's attractive, she has the basic look of Cersei, very long, straight black hair, and a, and a green kind of ornate outfit, so score on that. Uh, Icarus, uh, Icarus was a character type, uh, physical type that Kirby came back to many, many times before, which you wouldn't almost expect it from a guy, you know, born in the 1910s, uh, who was, you know, uh, in his 50s when the hippie revolution happened in the 60s, but he was cool like that, and he was also harkening back to, you know, the old olden days when, you know, haircuts weren't de rigueur as in his day, so he had like four characters he designed that I can think of, they're, okay, five, that all had very long blonde hair. Uh, and there was Thor, of course. There was Kazar, the second Kazar. Uh, there was Commandy, last boy on Earth. There was Icarus of the Eternals, and there's Captain Victory. And these guys all look kind of alike. They have that similar kind of wild vibe to them, you know, especially their hair and so that was Icarus. Well, they've thrown that all the way out of the fucking window and it's landed in a sewer somewhere. So uh, he's some clean cut male model type, dark hair, boring haircut, boring guy from the little bit of, he talks on here. And I'm like, this is Icarus? What, what, what happened? Um, and of course, Marvel will come up with some, but the fans protest the few Kirby Eternals fans there are of us in the universe, uh, in the world, will, you know, I'm sure Kevin Feige will, will provide some, you know, explanation for why they logically had to change him. 
which we're hearing for Shang-Chi and which you heard for Doctor Strange. And I'm going to get to that later. Um, so the next thing we see in the trailer is uh, Athena, played by Angelina Jolie. So we're this, this show, uh, this movie does have a few big stars, uh, or once big stars, or whatever, once big sex symbols. Um, and she looks great as Athena. Uh, as Athena, her her design is fine. And then we see Ajax, who I mentioned earlier. Now, in the comic books, Ajax was a male. So, and like I said, he spent his time in the Andes. Uh, hanging with the descendants of the Aztecs, Toltecs, Mayans, advanced civilizations that were boosted by the Celestials in previous times. Ajax may even have been alive during that period. I can't remember. I'm sure Kirby said. So Ajax. Ajax is now Salma Hayek. But she still has the blue and gold uh, um, blue and gold pattern of her costume. She's not wearing a big, ostentatious Kirby helmet that looked like a cross between a, you know, a, a sci-fi and a Aztec. Uh, but she does have a golden blue helmet, and it is kind of vaguely, uh, it's streamlined, but vaguely evocative. Now, I like her casting. You know, there's a lot of gender swapping in the casting in this movie. Um, well, I don't want to say a lot, but there's a bit. You know, uh, as much as you'd probably see... Uh, in some of the Netflix shows, Marvel shows, and uh, of maybe not of the same gravitas, but of the same import story-wise as the one in Captain Marvel, where Marvel was actually uh, Annette Bening, um, which I don't really have an opinion. I don't have an opinion either way about it. Uh, I do. Marvel was one of my all-time favorite characters growing up, and. I knew why they weren't going to make him a male because the movie was about a lot of it was about female empowerment. And if you had the male and her having to take the mantle of Marvel, it's like saying she's a knockoff. She's not good enough, which a lot of people said of, about the character, Ms. Marvel and, and Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers anyway. So let's drop all that baggage. So I get, yeah, I got it. Uh, in this case, you know, the gender swapping is more to create an even more multi-ethnic, diverse uh, civilization. Uh, it's like, you know, America, uh, the Eternals live uh, in, in the mountains of America. Um, I don't know if they live in Olympia in this. I hope it's called Olympia. Um, but in the comic books, Jack Kirby did this too. Uh, he had Kingo, who was the... Uh, the Japanese guy, I think he, he doubled as a samurai actor in the 40s. And he, of course, they're, they're all immortal, unkillable beings. Uh, and uh, he had some others. In the Peter B. Gillis series, he introduced Fostos, uh, a black eternal who was a weapons maker and also a, kind of a deviant slayer. And that should be like a band. But so... Anyway, where I am on the, I'm, I'm still only like a quarter of the way through the, the trailer. So the other reason I like Salma Hayek's casting is because she herself, being of her ethnic background, is a direct descendant of the uh, races like the Aztecs, Toltecs, and Mayans. And she has that great look, and she has that fantastic voice, and she's a very intelligent, hyper-intelligent, and very sexual being. And... Uh, her she voices over the trailer and it's very it kind of exudes wisdom so she's kind of the maybe not the leader of the Eternals but she's the shepherd of the Eternals towards what maybe the third host coming again or maybe you know shepherding them as they shepherd mankind um, so she appears on camera it's very cool then we see Fostos and he's making something with cosmic energy. It doesn't look like a weapon. It looks like some kind of work of art. Thirsty is making vegetation grow. Um, and then we meet Gilgamesh, uh, who in the original series by Kirby was called the Forgotten One. He had been many heroes throughout history. The base is probably of Hercules, Gilgamesh, and numerous others. I don't know, Kukulain or whatever that guy. And uh, I'm forgetting all my big heroes. Uh, throughout history. Uh, Samson, I, I don't know. Machiste, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but 
Uh, then they later took to calling him in the comics just Gilgamesh. So they, we see him, uh, and we, we hear in the voiceover that Cersei's saying, you know, we have kind of watched over them, we have guided them, uh, helped them progress, we have never uh, interfered. And then we, you know, see some pictures of uh, some shots of uh, Athena with her powerful staff, which she has in the comics. Um, and she's got the headdress, she's blonde, she looks like Athena. Then we see the Eternals assembling, and uh, we meet the uh, next gender-swapped character very briefly, Makari, who looks to be an Asian woman also playing that part. And she's got a vaguely red reminiscent costume of the comics but like icarus it's it's a bit different um and you know they were best friends in the comics and there was like a lot of humor between their interactions they would chide each other they've been chiding each other for many millennia um i don't think they're going to go that down that route um first of all they're having icarus and cersei as as lovers now while there was flirtation between the two and and probably at some point in the many many thousands of years they lived they they had sex just to see what it was like uh, with each other but they were not love interests in the kind book i Karis, of course uh fell in love with a mortal margo you know that kind of thor jane foster thing cersei later also fell in love with two mortals a, a scientist i forgot his name and i think it was a scientist and then Dane Whitman, the Black Knight, when she was a member of the Avengers. So, you know, they were down with the mortals, not each other. So, yeah, we see them kind of assembling and, you know, and they're assembling at uh, Mesopotamia, this kind of crown jewel of the ancient, civilization, uh, ancient world. And with the Ishtar Gate, they're in front of. And uh, there was a commentary. I watched this video. He explained the historical thing with that. I liked that. He also compared, he didn't compare overtly, but he also said that the coming of the Eternals to the primitive people in the beginning was the acknowledgement of three ships being sent out and found by the Indians, and the Indians greeting these as foreign, and then, of course, these people brought civilization. Well, besides the fact this is a, that's a totally debunked, politically incorrect reading of what really happened with fucking Columbus, uh... He didn't even mention that Kirby had the third three hosts, you know, that, that it was, you know, but again, it's the Eternals coming to see them rather than the Celestials. So I guess, again, they're crunching things together. So next we see McCary reading and she's super fast. Uh, and then we start to see Cersei in the, in the modern day and ordinary clothing. Uh, we see little Sprite, uh, you know, he's kind of a mischief maker uh, character from the Kirby run. He never grows up physically. And uh, in the game and run, he ended up becoming the villain. And, and what he did was he made all the Eternals forget who they were, and they lived as humans. Um, and Zoras, who had previously been canonically killed, uh, came back and snapped his neck and killed him. I'm not sure how that... Oh, I think because he became a human, too. That's how he was able to snap his neck. I wouldn't kill an eternal. Um, so uh, then we see this character who's supposed to be Druig, and Druig was a kind of uh, compadre of Zoras earlier generation, and he was a bit of a schemer, maybe a Loki-ish kind of character. So we're seeing him, and he looks kind of like Ezra Miller, uh, kind of like uh, yeah, we, you know, we need to talk about Druig is what I'm getting. Uh, that didn't impress me, but, uh, but, you know, he's going to probably function the same way that the young hipster version of Maximus did in the Inhumans, uh, short-lived, non-canonical ABC TV series of recent years. Um, so we see him using their powers, uh, we see Icarus and Cersei through the ages making out, we see Kingo, the samurai. It's got all kinds of flashes, and we're not really sure exactly who everyone is. The uh, reaction video I watched did help me with some of this, but it wasn't nearly as helpful as the one for Shang-Chi. It didn't do as many freeze frames and get into details of look at that. Instead, it went into 
hey, that could be Captain America Shield. That could be that could be a tie-in with with this comic book movie. Or again, like I said, the historical information he gave, which in the Mesopotamian sense was welcome, and the other sense was pointless, uh, unless you're gonna juxtapose it with Kirby. And Kirby is rarely mentioned in this guy's video. I'm not going to mention the guy's video because he's really not worth advertising for him. But um, I think about five minutes through the video, he, he, he there's a graphic of, you know, uh, one of the Eternals graphic novel collections. And it says, uh, uh, you know, by Jack Kirby, you know, who, cr who created the Eternals. OK, but then like five minutes later, Neil Gaiman, one of the giants of all comic books, wrote the most incredible Eternal series, and I think they're going to base this movie all on that. Now, yeah, Game & Stuff's commercial, and I can see they're, them uh, adapting it, however weak it was. I get it. Um, I see why people would think the idea of them losing their memory and walking among mankind and finding out they're these godlike, you know, immortal beings is an interesting hook. Uh, I could see why other people would like it. I personally don't care for it, at least not with the Eternals. I just don't see the point, but that's just me. But it's not always what the story is, but how it's done, and I did not like the way Gaiman did it. And if they're going to follow that suit, I'm not going to be into it, but I'll give it a chance. So uh, let's carry on. So then they show the Eternals kind of assembling, and they're just kind of assembling. They're just like kind of, you know, ready for a group shot. Um, and their costumes are varying levels of being interesting and or evocative of the original uh, Kirby art. In general, this is not very evocative of Kirby look-wise. Uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, the ship shown while it was, you know, a nod to 2001 that Kirby worked on in the comic. Uh, it wasn't evocative of, of the ships like they were used in Black Panther. They were very Kirby. And, and costumes here are not evocative of Kirby as uh, the ones in Thor Ragnarok. Now, I'm not really seeing the production design yet. We don't know what Olympia looks like. Maybe Olympia, they knocked it out of the park and it, 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 it did, you know, uh, the same... Uh, or what Kugler did for Wakanda or Watini did for uh, Sigar, but of course Sigar wasn't a Kirby creation, but he kind of made it like a Kirby-ish world. Um, so yeah, it's a little melodramatic and seemingly pointless. Uh, pose. And then um, I'll give you the title, The Eternal. I'm just going too loud and knocking me out here. I mean, oh. And then we end the trailer with Eternals all in normal clothes, human clothes, and this kid, Sprite, yeah, he says, now that Captain Rogers and, what did he say? And Iron Man are gone, uh, who do you think is going to lead the Avengers? And then I, I Kara says, uh, I could, and then everyone kind of laughs at him. There's these pauses. And to be honest, this one scene of silly knockoff Marvel humor is it's longer than any other part of the trailer. It, it lingers on the shot. I mean, it's like a part of a sc actual scene. And they put it at the end of a two-minute teaser. And so any momentum they've built has been completely destroyed by the need to make these jokes. Now, I mean, the Shang-Chi trailer... You know, they the, they rescue the bus, and Katie says, says, we make a good team, but it's all happening very fast, you know, and, it, yeah, it's silly, but, it, you know, it's like, okay, it doesn't break the energy of the trailer. This one, it all but gets quiet. The Icarus actor has all the uh, charisma, you know, of a, of a disheveled uh, piece of wet cardboard, and and that's it. And that's our trailer. So, yeah, overall, I'd call it a definite fail um, in the context of an adaptation of Jack Kirby's Eternals or as an adaptation of any iteration of Marvel's Eternals. 
uh, unless you're really still in the, it's going to be like Neil Gaiman camp. Um, casting, Icarus is a total fail. I'll never accept that guy. Maybe the next movie he'll grow his hair long or whatever. Um, and, and dye it blonde. Um, but there are elements that intrigue me, uh, mainly the older, uh, the older former sex symbol actresses, uh, who are kind of the matriarchal figures in this story, uh, Ajax, Salma Hayek, and Athena, Angelina Jolie. I thought those were both very well done. If they're going to do a gender swap, do it, do it like this. Salma Hayek was perfect. It's perfect for Ajax. So, uh, not enough of McCary to have an opinion, not enough of Kingo to have an opinion, or Gilgamesh. Uh, too much of Icarus and, and emphasis on their eternal love, which didn't happen in the source material. Uh, I, and we're, there is a kind of a dude who keeps floating around, the, the, a human guy with a beard. And that's supposed to be Dane Whitman. Um, Dane Whitman in the Marvel comic books became the Black Knight. Well, he was introduced as the Black Knight in the mid-1960s. Uh, by Roy Thomas, um, and uh, kind of was a supporting occasional Avenger, occasional Defender, and then he got like frozen into stone for several years, and finally the the Avengers and Defenders found this uh, object called the Evil Eye, and they liberated him, but his spirit went to another dimension, and his body was still stone, and it was destroyed. I think in a battle between Wonder Man and the Vision or something like that. And eventually he got a physical body back. And then he became a core Avenger from like the mid 80s all the way through the late 90s. And in that period, Cersei became an Avenger and they became lovers. So, you know, they're crunching that into the two. And somebody on one of these videos speculated that, you know, uh, Cersei's forgotten Icarus uh, and, you know, fallen in love with a human Dane. And that's fine. I like, I like the actress who plays Cersei. She seems cool. Not as uh, catty and mischievous uh, as Cersei was. A little more compassionate, maybe. But we'll see. Um, the Sprite kid looks like Sprite. Um, the character, not the soft drink. And so, yeah. So I thought that was kind of overall a fail, but uh, an intriguing fail. Uh, you know, I'm ready to see the real trailer and get down to it. What is this movie really about? What is the meat of this movie other than this vague kind of concept? And admittedly, a high concept, but I applaud the fact it began with the whole idea of the, the aliens or the gods advancing human civilization because that was a huge part of Kirby's concept. But like I said, no celestials or deviants yet, and some strange deviations uh, from the source material. So let's get into the next what's up with MCU this week. And this is one that I'm just going to read you some of this article, and I'm going to do a Jimmy Dore, and I'm going to read you some of this article off the screen and then react. Um, so let me see here. Make sure I get this up. I'm going to try not to go over an hour if I can. All right. The headline on the Mary Sue is the website. It says, Kevin Figa's regret over casting Tilda Swinton feels five years too late, especially after Endgame. Okay. One of the most controversial casting decisions in recent Marvel history was the casting of white actress Tilda Swinton to play the Ancient One, a character who in the comics was an old ancient man. Five years later, Marvel Cinematic Universe architect Kevin Fiega has admitted it was the wrong call. Uh, I've been sharing this, and half the people who, I, I guess they just don't read the article, which I understand. It happens a lot. By the way, Princess Weeks wrote this. I'm giving her credit. I don't know who she is, but... Um, you know, the people that I post it for, they're, like, resurrecting the controversy again. Like, what should they have done? That's not what this article is about. This article is closing the controversy. It's Kevin Fiega saying, the fans were right, I was wrong. Can we move forward? Can we all get along? And, and man, I have a lot of respect for him for doing this. Um, uh, when Doctor Strange came out, I was very 
Doctor Strange is one of my like top five, maybe my number two favorite Marvel character of all time. And the movie really disappointed me. Uh, it didn't capture capture the the, the feeling of, of really many of the great runs, many great runs on Doctor Strange over 30, 40 years. Um, Cumberbatch was okay. Uh, he was better as Doctor Strange uh, in the subsequent appearances than other people's movies. Um, but uh, what I was going to say, before I got way off track, is at the time it came out, uh, a lot of us were protesting this casting. And, of course, you know, Kevin Fiega was pretty you know, matter-of-fact about it. He wasn't a dick about it. Uh, you know, he wasn't making excuses, but... You know, he hinted that the Chinese market and blah, 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 we've got to pacify them. And so this urban legend began that, uh, I mean, somebody in the Marvel camp may have believed this, uh, that they couldn't have a Tibetan character uh, in a Chinese movie. It would be considered taboo because the Chinese, you know, do have a draconian, uh, not very nice government. And I'm not... I'm not trying to contribute to the China phobia any more than the Russia phobia. Russia Gate was bullshit, uh, you know. And then the United States is a right-wing authoritarian country, but so is China. Let's just call it that way it is. Um, and, and Tibet is a situation where they've been particularly heinous, among others. And I remember Tiananmen Square. So, um, but this is the deal. And I'm going to say this, you know, categorically. And I said this to a, a fantasy writer on Facebook who I really thought should know better. He maybe he just wasn't clear here, but he said, "Yeah, Marvel did this mainly because, you know, the Tibetan uh, thing with China." And okay, first of all, the Ancient One is not a Tibetan character. He has become mislabeled as the Tibetan character over the decades because. Tibet and Nepal are both on Mount. They are both on sides of Mount Everest, the largest peak in the world. But they're two different countries, and Tibet is persecuted by China, and Nepal has been friends with China for quite a while. And it's been stated explicitly that Kamartaj, the fictional little city that Steve Ditko made up, where the Ancient One resides is in Nepal. So enough of this. The ancient one wasn't Tibetan. You know, why can't the facts get circulated like the rumors and the uh, misinformation and the disinformation? Pet peeve of mine, I know you know this about me. Kevin Figa goes on to say this, and I've got to say, this took a lot of guts. So this interview was with Men's Health Magazine. They're quoting. We thought we were being so smart and so cutting edge. We're not going to do the cliche of the wizened old wise Asian man. But it was a wake up call to say, well, wait a minute. Is there any other way to figure it out? Is there any other way to both not fall into the cliche and cast an Asian actor? And the answer to that, of course, is yes, which they're demonstrating with the Mandarin in the Shang-Chi movie. But they didn't have the guts to do it then, or or the cultural respect, the, the savvy, the creativity. So they could have, and a lot of us were saying this at the time. Something else I was saying a long time ago uh, on alt news groups in 2007, people were like, who's going to play the Mandarin? And I continually brought up Tony Leung, only one person of dozens who read my stuff even knew who he was. Um, of course, he was coming off of two, 2046, which you know, has become my favorite film of all time, and he my favorite actor. Uh, so when he was cast as the Mandarin, I, I thought I was hallucinating it, but you know, I was suggesting it to people on the internet 14 years ago. Same thing with this situation. Let's reconfigure him and still make him an Asian mentor to Doctor Strange. It's there's not enough Asian parts going around. Hollywood's accused of Asia phobia. Okay, so here we go into this next part. Swinton's character appeared in both the 2016 film and made a cameo in Avengers Endgame in 2019. While I am going to receive Kevin's con comments in good faith, it does not erase the fact 
that people had been calling this out since the casting choice was made, only to be told we didn't understand the vision Marvel was making, especially when they were asking us to pat them on the back for making a character a woman. So she just said what I just said, basically, and maybe better. Um, yeah, they were abusive to us online, uh, arrogant uh, and obnoxious. And when I say they, I don't mean Kevin Fiega and all the Marvel executives. It was this, one of them was this guy I'm about to mention as I read further. Director Scott Derrickson tried his best to explain how they wanted to make the Ancient One avoid stereotypes, especially once they changed the character to a woman. But the result, as writer Jen Yamato explained, was erasure. And she said, in order to avoid one offensive stereotype, Derrickson and company effectively erased the Ancient One's Asianness, along with it disappeared any discernible debt the character might have represented the place and the people and the culture of the film setting, costumes, and multicultural, multicultural spiritual mishmash still borrows. But see, there's still camartage, there's still buildings that, and costumes that are kind of Asian-flavored, uh, but there's no fucking ancient one in, a, in being Asian. Uh, then she goes on, this other writer, Jen, goes on to say, in trying to be one kind of woke, Doctor Strange became most unfortunately unwoke. And that's a lesson Marvel, Disney, and other Hollywood studios should learn from. <laughs> In the process, the director, Scott Derrickson, says he learned a lot about the term whitewashing from the irate Asian community that took to the internet to take him and Marvel to task. That's a quote from him. At the time when casting was happening, there's a lot of anger circulating about female representation but the term whitewashing wasn't even a term I knew in the way it's used now, he explained. I knew in the classical sense of yellow face of white actors playing Asian characters. So I wasn't as sensitive to that issue, but I was aware I was erasing a potential Asian role. But you know what? I fucking did it anyway. And I went on their official page before the movie came out. A, a lot of the idea, uh, Derrickson's uh, push to do this also was the Doctor Strange co-writer. Uh, I forgot his first name. Uh, his last name's Cargill, C-A-R-G-I-L-L. -L. And the stuff they were peddling on that Facebook page was like this, only even more bullshit and more more uh, ignorance and uh, backtracking and, you know. And Cargill made a, I don't remember what he said, but Cargill made a particularly what I thought egregiously offensive and arrogant state, you know, statement basically saying, you know, we know better than you fucking fans. You know, fuck you. And we see what's happened in the past when that attitude has been displayed to fans by people in movies. Now, sometimes it goes on, you know, they let it slide. Like when Clark Gregg told Jim Steranko, hey, if you don't like our S.H.I.E.L.D. show, go make your own. Um, I didn't let that slide, but most people did. They liked Clark Gregg or whatever. Um, this one really was one that people didn't let slide. They just resigned themselves to it. Okay, so I'm going to go on a little bit with this because this is going to give you some tie together of the whole Asian thing coming into Shang-Chi. Comics have a long history of leaning into Asian stereotypes. And the ancient one, the wise old mystical Asian monk who helps the white man on his journey to be the best magician, is certainly a tired old cliche, one that many said could be corrected by casting Doctor Strange as an Asian man, the same thing people said about Iron Fist when the same tropes were being discussed. Okay, first of all, I'm against that idea. Stephen Strange was American. Uh, if you'd made him Asian, first of all, you'd be changing the whole context of his story. He's very much a white, American, extremely wealthy male uh, in the original comics, you know, who became successful in the 1950s, the height of American prosperity. We do the sliding time scale. I guess he became successful in the 1980s, the age of excess. But either way, I think it's germane to his character that he is a white American. Not saying he needs to save Asia and he can only do it because he's a white American, because he gets humbled. He loses everything, he loses his hand, his use of his hands, he loses all his money, he becomes an alcoholic, he has no he's homeless, you know, and only through spirituality is he able to reobtain those things. And that is taught by this Asian community. 
I don't know what's the problem with that. I, I, story wise, I think it's compelling and I think it's classic. Um, now, in the case of Iron Fist, I, I kind of see what they're saying. I, I still wouldn't want them to cast an Asian actor because it wouldn't be accurate to the comics. And that's important to me. That's in my top couple of things that matter the most to me in these adaptations is how faithful they are to the spirit and essence and to an extent, the letter of the comics. Um, so, but this person says there was absolutely no reason why an East Asian actor could not be put into that role and actually deliver some good Asian reputation as early as 2016. Well, no, from a, you know, humanitarian or aesthetic, uh, viewpoint no there wasn't any reason uh, uh but there's absolutely no reason why it couldn't be done it is i don't agree with with her there at all uh marvel was likely bolstered in their thinking at the time because of the overall positive response to iron man 3's decision to bait and switch the mandarin character by splitting it into kai guy pierce and king ben kingsley respectively a choice that was eventually switched up again in the short All Hail the King 2014, in which Ben Kingsley's character is broken out of jail to meet the real Mandarin, who will apparently be played by the guy I said should have played him all along, Tony Leung Chu Wai, and is the father of Shang Chi in the upcoming Marvel film Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. So that is a seven year way to get visible East Asian representation for one of the few long-lasting Chinese villains in comics that could have been removed as stereotypes to make him an actual powerful antagonist of Tony Stark. Exactly. He should have been Asian all along. He should have been Tony Leon all along. And he should have been, depending on the writer's agenda, but I think he should have been above Obadiah Stane and, and these various villains in, in 2 and 3. I think he should have been the, the arch nemesis of Iron Man, as he was. And you could even go with the schism between capitalism and, I mean, there's so much there with with Tony Stark and the arms deal, you know, the, his arms being used by terrorists. And then, of course, the uh, connection with the Ten Rings organization that's in the first Iron Man movie. It was a hint, and it wasn't a hint that was played out the way a lot of us were hoping. Um, and this person says, this writer, I remember skipping Doctor Strange because of Swinton's casting. And I groaned when she appeared in Endgame because at that point, the backlash had been loud and clear. It felt like a doubling down. Yeah, she didn't need to be in that movie. Um, I mean, I guess if you want to be somewhat thorough, but anyway, we'll get into that another time or maybe not at all. Uh, I had several problems with her appearance and it wasn't just that. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I almost skipped Doctor Strange. I didn't go see it in the theater. I saw it for free on Netflix, and yeah. Okay, so the concluding here with the rise of Asian hate in the country, I'm sure everyone has become more aware of these mistakes, including Figa, but it feels exhausting when people who are bringing this up very loudly for years, why do bloodshed and harm end up being the only way people understand discrimination hold themselves accountable? Okay, so that writer just redeemed themselves for saying Dr. Strange should have been an Asian actor but anyway but an article in general i agree with her most of her points completely um and the points made by the woman that she quoted jen yamato and and with what kevin figa said we thought we were being so smart and so cutting edge he says it all man and that's the snotty attitude that scott derrickson and cargill had on social media when this happened kind of like the arrogant attitude nick spencer had when people called him on making captain america a hydra agent it's like yeah fuck you you know kind of the way tom brevoort was when people started noticing how shitty the civil war uh miniseries was the comic book uh yeah well you don't understand it and yeah we got we're going for something big that's always been Brevoort's way. He shepherded Nick Spencer through the same kind of uh, PR maze. So you wonder why I have no, you know, respect for Marvel and its current comic book publishing incarnation. But we're talking about the movies, and the movies, uh, as I've stated before, are closer to the characters that, that I grew up with that I felt affinity for. But there have been some missteps. Doctor Strange... 
uh, has certainly been one. Not just that element, but the entire movie, Doctor Strange, was a big misstep, in my opinion. Uh, they took a uh, film writer and uh, TCM uh, employee, Kimberly Lindbergh's very cool woman that I know on Facebook and, and great film writer. You know, she said with Doctor Strange, they took one of Marvel's greatest creations and turned it into, you know, a tepid, tedious mess and just, you know, boring. And, and there's no point to it. And I, I'm paraphrasing that last part, but but I agree with her. Yes, it, it was a tepid, tedious mess. And, uh, you know, so anyway, uh, I will watch Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness or whatever directed by Sam Raimi. I want to see what happens to Wanda next. And I want to see if they do develop uh cumberbatch is strange as a more interesting character uh but this is the last chance i'm giving them on doctor strange the eternals i don't know if i'll see in the theater or not. i i guess i don't know who knows just going back seeing movies in the theater thing i got to remember how to get into the routine because this hasn't been part of our lives for so long now so that's my reportage. I know I was kind of a Debbie Downer on these things, but I also wanted to share truth and facts regarding Eternals and its sources and its need to be thankful and devoted and not lose sight of Jack Kirby and his mammoth accomplishments. And I wanted, of course, obviously, to stress the fact that uh, what those guys did at Marvel with Tilda Swinton was stupid and it was yes racist um i know everyone throws that word around these days and it'll it'll cancel you um not trying to cancel kevin figa but some of the comments that the other two guys made at the time were kind of borderline racist because if you think about it it's like saying we can't show an asian guy uh, being a master of martial arts and mystic arts and all this kind of stuff and uh, in this elaborate outfit, you know, it's, it's, it's racism. It's, it, it is perpetuating, stereo, perpetuating stereotypes that were badly done by Western artists and filmmakers. But has anyone watched any Shaw Brothers films? I mean, there's characters like that in every single fucking movie. And they're awesome. That's their culture. They're doing period piece. And from what I can tell from the Shang-Chi trailer, they are incorporating those Kung Fu and Wuxia film elements into the backstory of the Mandarin. Again, which is perfect because Tony Leung has played those kind of characters, you know, in uh, Butterfly and Sword and uh, Ashes of Time Redux, uh, Hero. But anyway... Uh, I've gone on a bit, so that's it for now. I'm going to do a blue review soon, and I know you're all excited. You know, just try to try to keep it under control till I pop up again. Love you guys.